So um, welcome back for the conservation working group. Um, this week, my plan is that we will look at the survey results from the commercial um, business survey that I sent out. And we currently have, let's see how many, fair number of responses. Um, it's now, you know, we have 23 responses. It gets up to 40, I have to pay more money to, to be able to show more than 40 responses. But um, it's been uh, on the, the front page of the town's website, been out through email, been on Facebook. Um, I was at the something special event today at um, the park and had people access it through a QR code and paper available for people who don't like doing things on their phones. Um, so the responses have been coming in. Um, so I thought we would go through that relatively quickly and then get back to the table um, that we managed to get through one row of last week. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, um, wrap up the other two rows or other three rows uh, tonight. It was, it was calm, wasn't it? <laughs> calm? As, as opposed to rows? Oh, I think it's rows. I should, I would think, it, yeah, it was rows. Was we got it? through the, the low density residential row, um, but we have the rural two, rural one, and high priority yeah, yeah. to go. Yeah. So um, I'm going to share my screen. So you have the survey results in the matrix, or? I have them a few different ways, um, but I was going to try this way. And if we want to look at it in a matrix instead, we can. So this way I have for each question, a graph of the responses. And um, I made a copy of the key here so that you can see it. So for mm -hmm. industrial, um, one person thought industrial should be allowed everywhere. Four people allowed only on state highways. Um, nobody only off state highways, eight people allow only under special circumstances and for not allow anywhere. Um, and the vast majority of people thought it required strong site plan review criteria if it was allowed. Seems like most people felt like it shouldn't be allowed generally. Only under special circumstances or not at all. The light industrial, um, slightly more thought that it should be allowed only on state highways, still none only off state highways. Two people thought it should be allowed everywhere. Um, the largest, uh, but fairly close. One more person thought it should be allowed only under special circumstances than only on state highways. Um, few people not anywhere. And this one was also strong site plan review criteria for the planning board was heavily favored. For small light industrial, um, sorry, we lost that here. It would have been nice if you had asked uh, people where they lived so that we could tell whether or not they lived on a state highway. Sure. Um, but this is the information that we have. And uh, so for small light industrial, we have more people starting to say this should be allowed everywhere. Um, slightly more than that allowed only on a state highway. Um, even the most only under special circumstances and a few people not allowed anywhere. Again, strong site plan review some people inching up on the medium site plan review. Office had a huge number of people who said it should be allowed everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, smaller amounts for the other categories. Um, and it was also feeling that it should have less strong site plan review or um, staff only review. Professional services, again, was a large number of should be allowed anywhere. Um, smaller numbers in the other categories and no one 
thought that it should not be allowed anywhere. Um, this one, medium site plan review, um, got the most votes there, uh, followed by staff only site plan review. Uh, daycare was another strong, should be allowed everywhere. Um, and uh, more of a mix between strong, medium site plan review and staff site plan review with a few people saying don't require site plan review. Uh, kennel had significantly less than daycare and professional services and office saying it should be allowed anywhere, but that was still the largest contingent. Um, and then I think a fair amount saying strong site plan review, more saying medium and less in the no or staff only review. Um, for indoor recreation, we had a fairly high number saying allow anywhere um, or only along state highways. Um, one person said only under special circumstances. Uh, the majority here was medium site plan review, um, followed by strong or staff only. For outdoor recreation, it was a much higher percentage uh, for allowed everywhere. Um, a small number of people said only on state highways, even small, just one person only off state highways, and two people only under special circumstances. Um, however, despite saying it should be allowed everywhere the, um, for site plan review, people felt it needed strong site plan review criteria, um, followed by medium and staff or no site plan review. Um, large retail, no one thought that large retail should be allowed everywhere. Um, the strongest two equal responses were allowed only on the state highway or not allowed anywhere. Um, and the site plan review was highly skewed to strong site plan review criteria. Medium sized retail, there starts to be a few people who would like it with no site plan allowed everywhere. Um, a lot, still a lot of people who say it should only be allowed on the state highway. Um, no one who said only off state highways, five people allow only under special circumstances and three and not allowed at all. Um, still the majority here is requiring strong site plan review though there's uh, about double for both categories. The people who said um, medium site plan review or staff only review compared to the large retail. For small retail, um, now we're getting to almost parity between allowed everywhere and allowed only on state highway um, with allowed everywhere being the higher number. Um, and uh, also a medium site plan review is the majority for this instead of strong site plan review. Um, for micro retail, as a a very strong should be allowed everywhere. Um, no one said it should not be allowed anywhere. What's an example of a micro retail? Uh, it's any retail that's under 2000 square feet. So a lot of, you know, uh, ice cream shop, um, lots of little stores. Uh, it was only limited by that size. So a lot of gift stores are in this size range. Um, a lot of cafes or ice cream or um, other small shops, basically. I think it would have been better if we somehow had been able to determine the amount of traffic to these shops. Because, or, yeah, that's not, that's not something you can ever know, though, because when you open a shop, you hope it gets lots of traffic, um, but there's no way to know. And the size is really not a great determinant of how much traffic it gets. So we, what, we, what we can know is the size of the business. Um, David, yeah. on, on the commons, um, are you, I have this vague memory that the small stores, the single space stores are about 2000 square feet. Does that sound right to you? 
Um, there is quite a range, um, but I, I think, you know, if you're thinking about something that's like uh, 20 to 30 feet wide, um, that's probably in the 2,000 square feet range. Yeah. Um, Ithaca, Cuga, Optical, um, any of those narrow, you know, one rack yeah. space yeah. spaces. So the, anything, might... so the answer to you, Rhonda, is anything that could fit into a small store on the commons. Well, what about a pizza pizza store that do, doesn't have much in the way of uh, sit down business? So you have well, all this traffic. Yeah, that would be a restaurant. So. Ah, uh, that's true. Which is our next but category? It, why Which isn't is an, an ice cream, cream shop a restaurant? Good question. I, I think that's pretty significantly different than a restaurant. Um, yes. What if they sell hamburgers? Are you talking well, to me telling me that Purity is not a restaurant then? No, I think Purity has become a restaurant. Right. The old Purity. Um, but I would tell you that Sweet Melissa's is not a restaurant. But Sweet not Melissa's had a shop in Trumansburg that I think had tables. Well, that was a restaurant. I'm talking about uh, the one in Ithaca. Uh, would you use the health department definition of a restaurant? In other words, if it gets inspected, it's a restaurant. No, because I think everything gets inspected. I, I, I don't want to get blown off track by okay. this designation. Um, so a uh, restaurant or bar was the next category, which um, the largest response for location was should only be allowed on a state highway. Um, although there was a fair number of people who said it should be allowed everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, smaller number that said it should be allowed only under special circumstances. No one said it should only be off state highways or not allowed anywhere. Um, most, the largest majority of people said strong site plan review, but it was pretty close to medium site plan review. Mm -hmm. A restaurant with a drive through you can mm -hmm. see the difference um, between six people said a regular restaurant or a bar should be allowed everywhere. Only one person thought a restaurant with a drive through should be allowed everywhere, but a, the same amount, 11 people for both, thought it should be allowed on state highways. Um, and a few people, six people said only under special circumstances, and four people said not anywhere. So the majority thought a drive-through would be appropriate on a state highway. Uh, with strong site plan review criteria, um, much fewer people said that medium site plan review criteria would be appropriate with a drive-through compared to without a drive-through. It's pretty consistent with the sense of the group when we last talked about it too. Yeah, um, and this may clear things up. We had cafe ice cream smoothie as its own type of use, so not regular retail. Um, and it was fairly close between allowed everywhere and allowed only on state highways with on state highways being one more person. Um, and two people said it should only be under special circumstances. No one said it shouldn't be allowed or should only be allowed off of state highways. Um, the largest bar here for site plan review is medium site plan review followed by staff only um, with just a couple people thinking it needed strong site plan review. Um, for a hotel, nobody thought a hotel should be allowed everywhere. Um, a lot of people thought it should only be allowed on state highways. No one thought it should be allowed off state highways. A few people said only under special circumstances and, and less not allowed at all. Um, requiring strong site plan review is the clear winner there. Mm. Bed and breakfast has a huge bar for should be allowed everywhere. Um, and medium site plan review or staff review are the two highest um, with a few people, only a few people thinking it required strong site plan review. Garden center is another big allowed everywhere bar. Garden to you. Um, and it's a tie between medium site plan review and staff only review. 
I wish you had put something in there about having off street off street parking. Do you think that a a nursery or garden center should have off street parking? I think that a nursery or garden center should have as much off street parking as they want. It, Good. It so what do you plan to do about that? <laughs> Since we have a nursery that doesn't have any off street parking. Well, they they have exactly as much off street parking as they want. It, it's interesting that large stores were not very popular, but a garden center, which could be as large as a large store, is very popular. Yep. Yep. Very, very interesting. You know, imagine the garden store, the garden store, the garden center part of Lowe's. That would be a huge store just by itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more like Baker's Acres and... Uh... Well, look at Baker's yeah. Acres, they even they have a big parking lot. And on certain times, they're really overflowing with people. Yeah, they're in yeah. hot, they're in a busy season. So under David's, uh, David's plan, then if Baker's Acres didn't want to have parking, they would have to park out there on 34. And that's totally inappropriate. Uh, they do want to have parking, so they have parking. Yeah. yeah. But we need to require parking. Yeah, I right. disagree, but that's also not what we're talking about right now. So I'm going to move right. on. Just, just, just to put it on the table, I think that the survey design itself tended to skew the results, as we will see from the event venue that's come, that's about to come up. If you wouldn't want something that were, that gets a hundred people. On a side, on a side, off a, off a side highway, but no, it's allowed everywhere. You know, this one is a particular case. There are places you really don't want it, but it's allowed everywhere. Wait, what are you talking about being allowed everywhere that you wouldn't, you wouldn't want? And that, the one that's now in the, that's now visible event venue. So it says we're allowing it everywhere, which includes off state highways. Yeah. It, 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 it's a design problem in the question. How so? Um, allowed everywhere means state highways, tiny little roads in the middle of nowhere, everything. Yeah, right. Let's and start. you really don't, you don't want something that's going to draw 100 people at a time to it on a regular basis on some of our smaller roads. At least that's my opinion, but I think that's just logic. Well, it seems like other people disagree with you. I don't think that's a problem I, because, with the question. The, what I'm saying is the, the question the design of the survey led its, leads to responses that are probably not reflecting what people think. It's what they thought. You know, if you don't know what a wedding venue is, you know, with 100 parking for 150 people, you might say, oh, put it anywhere. But in fact, it does not make sense. Do you think it, it, that people don't know what a event or wedding concert venue is? I'm not sure what the... Well, you, I, I'll give you, for example, celebrations on Route 79, is it? Yeah. Yep, yeah. so that's precisely what an event venue is. Would you want that on Gunderman Road? Would you want oh. that on Bald Hill Road? That's everywhere. And I don't think if, asked, if the question were asked in those terms, the answers would be very different. I think it has to do with the traffic along the road because some, most of these large event places take up a lot of, of uh, physical space, acreage, and they can park them on the, the grass or whatever place they have. But the people living around them when the car went 200 or so cars go by somebody's house at all hours to this event, it can be really disturbing. Yeah, it's interesting that people seem to be willing to tolerate that according to this, even though in, in the past, when, when we've had uh, the kind of businesses that do draw a lot of traffic, it, it generated uh, neighborhood concern, if not opposition. Yeah. 
that 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 sort of quest that sort of um, <clears throat> that, 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 that conflict that you're just stating, Joel, is exactly why I think they, that the question was not well understood. Um, well, it may be just a it may just be a, a case of uh, I like it in principle, just not in my backyard. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, the data we have, and it's a small. Uh, was that Toby trying to speak? Because I didn't catch it. Oh, I just said it's the data we have, and it is a relatively small sample. Yes, but this it's, is true. It's, it's sort of basic information that kind of gives us a general yeah. direction, but the specifics yeah. may be a little sketchy. Yeah, yeah. It, true. It, it, I think it would be unwise to use this survey as the basis of any decisions. It, 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 you know, it ought to be ex explained what some of these questions really are. Well, uh, well I mean, I think it's Catherine somewhat has, indicative. Yeah, Catherine has her hand up. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I answered some of those that way myself, considering how I would feel if there were a mechanic next door to me. And my response in that was that I might not mind having a one person mechanic in a garage next door to me. Um, and, and I, and it would depend, it could depend on a lot of the other uh, relevant uh, constraints that would be put on by environmental concerns. This, this is a beginning, as I understood it, to try and gauge what people might be willing to tolerate it is, or might actually want because you're thinking about um, expanding the nothing anywhere. Uh, anyway, yeah. I think it's important to think about it as as a, a way to begin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we can see while the largest number of people said that they think uh, event venues should be allowed everywhere, they also thought that it needed strong site plan review criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. So we we can see the way people are thinking about it from um, their responses between those two, whether they think it should be allowed and whether they are concerned about how it's allowed. Mm -hmm. and I don't think there's anything particularly leading about the, the way the question is formed. Um, the next question was a mechanic um, to which, again, the majority was allowed anywhere. A uh, close second was allowed only on state highways, um, followed by uh, only under special circumstances and only off state highways. Uh, most, the uh, strongest number of people thought that that required medium site plan review, but it's very close to strong site plan review. Um, a car, motorcycle, boat, or tractor dealer. Um, very small number of people. One thought it should be allowed everywhere. 15, the vast majority, only on a state highway. Um, only one person said it shouldn't be allowed anywhere in the town. Um, and three people thought only under special circumstances. Um, but the clear winner here is strong site plan review if this use was allowed. Uh, gas station, mm -hmm. a few people said anywhere. A lot of people said allowed only on the state highway. Um, even more, 18. I think this is the strongest uh, strong site oh. review mm -hmm. answer of any of them. I scroll up, yeah. Um, so that was the one that more people said needed strong site plan review than anything else. Um, even than junkyard. Junkyard. Really? Wow. Um, the majority said shouldn't be allowed anywhere. Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of people just because they thought it shouldn't be allowed anywhere, they didn't uh, answer the site plan review criteria question, which is why we have so many less. Explain something that I have observed, uh, you know, because I've been looking and looking and looking. Even today, when I went to Whitney Point, I was looking at what was going on on 79 in Carolina and Slaterville Springs. And what I have observed is a reverse gentrification. That's the only thing that I can call it. 
So in Danby right now, because we have very few businesses, we have houses coming up in all kinds of places. And the houses, it, from my perspective, the houses tend to be really a mixture for the most part, except when you get into these developments, places like uh, Beardsley Lane and Old Town Village and things like that, where the, the houses have a similar value to them. But the houses elsewhere are, are mixed in that you might have a $100,000 house next to a $250,000 house. And not, uh, I've never heard anybody complain about that. It just seems to be the way things are built. On the other hand, this reverse gentrification happens when you have uh, these businesses, let's say uh, uh, in lock, I've noticed it where you have anything that deals with cars or repair of cars, trucks, any kind of motorized uh, vehicle, anything like that. Once they go in, the land value or the value of the house goes down. And all of a sudden you start getting all of these small um, inexpensive houses going in around those businesses. And so the people who have expensive houses don't want to build there. And so it's kind of, to me, I would call it reverse gentrification. It's the value goes down wherever you have these businesses. And on 79 in Caroline, they now have a big Caterpillar tractor business right there at 79. And I would think that the value of the houses around that business are now go going down. Okay. Uh, do we have other thoughts about the outcome of the survey? Uh, yes, I was interested in the uh, responses to the bed and breakfast because we heard from someone in the last meeting about concerns with Airbnb rentals, which aren't exactly a bed and breakfast. Uh, and I know Ithaca has been grappling with this and I don't know if it's something we need to think about uh, in a rural setting. I guess it doesn't matter if different people are staying in a house next door or in a neighborhood so much as in the city where it's, uh, you're closer together. But I just, that had just occurred to me. We have quite a few Airbnb places in Danby, Toby. If you if you search for an Airbnb in Danby, there's some kind of hilarious feud going on between some people that they have made up these ridiculous listings, um, making fun of another listing. Um, really? Like Five thousand dollars a night to stay in a chicken shed. Um, I found it very amusing uh, looking at recently, um, but we, we have had ongoing questions about short-term rentals and that includes Airbnb, VRBO, Hip Camp. There's a lot of them. Um, my understanding is that the previous planner's interpretation, and I think Joel, you were involved in the decision, was that our zoning currently allows residential uses and the way it was defined um, there was nothing about the length of renting a residential space for use. And so there was an assumption that um, someone could rent out a house for a day or a week um, if they wanted to. I think it would make sense to consider that a different use and decide um, as a community how, how it should be I think one of the things we have to be careful about is glamping. And uh, I think there's something going on on 96B right now that is not glamping, but is some sort of get together like that. Yeah, I think um, glamping is a really interesting phenomenon that's allowing people with land to um, to make money and keep that land open or keep it in farming. Um, it's something that I've seen people doing as an additional income stream. Um, so I do think that that is important to think about. 
Um, uh, we just need to make sure people. that the people who want to engage in glamping actually are um, follow certain rules in providing enough services to the people who are going to be staying there. What kind of bathroom services are they going to have? That sort of thing. Yeah, those are all, I think anything like that would need approval by the health department and they're really the ones that are appropriate for dealing with those questions. Um, but I, I have heard from from some people who said, you know, I, I want to buy this large lot and I'd like to keep it large, um, but I need the incomes, an income stream and it's not really farmable. And I was thinking about, you know, building a few A-frames and renting them out or putting up some yurts or um, something else like that. And we, our zoning currently doesn't define anything uh, similar analogous to that. I do think yes, that, that there are some people already doing that with and without permits, but yeah. they are, yeah. So I, I do think it would be good to think about that use and um, defining it and including well, the it. whole The whole um, class of, of occupations that's, you know, hunting cabins and, you know, short-term rentals, uh, it, it went arguably, it's a slippery slope from there to turning into a year round residence, but we ought to be able to distinguish and, and um, you know, deal with it as a separate class. But we haven't so far. It's a, and it's that clearly it's a need to at least think about it and, what, and whether and whether and how much it should be regulated. Yeah. So the place I was talking about on 96B is 1725. Danby Road, and they're listed as JNC Christian Counseling Service. And you will see on the weekends, they have these, all of these cars parked out there and the people are camping over for the weekend. So that's, that goes well beyond uh, B and B. There's uh, whether the people are paying any money for staying there, I have no idea. Uh, so they wouldn't be paying um, taxes for tourism purposes or anything like that. And these sorts of diversions from the norm, uh, we really need to look into. I think campgrounds are covered by our zoning. Uh, Toby, you've got your hand up. That was from before. Sorry, I'll oh. withdraw my hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, they would claim that they're a religion, you know, Christian. Oh, sure. Maybe not. They're a religious camp. There's one in Caroline. You know, that's been there for a year. From the Seventh, well, Seventh Day Adventist Church, I think, has a has a summer campground. But again, we get back into the whole business of: do, Are they providing enough bathroom services for the people? And that sort yeah, of thing. That's all, yeah. that's all the health department's job. Yeah. We've got one in Danby on Lee Road with uh, the, uh, the, the Raid, uh, Marcia um, Raiden and, and David. And so is the health department looking into that or taking care of it or regulating had, it in any way? Yep. yep. They've had some pretty heavy duty uh, regulatory visits. Mm. So maybe we could get back to responses or thoughts about the feedback that people have given us in the survey. Well, I mean, I, I was a little surprised because I, I, as were you, I guess, um, and how many people were willing to tolerate some of these businesses and most anywhere, as mm -hmm. long as we adequately address uh, you know, the concerns that the neighbors might have with site plan review. Yeah. I would say it's it's reflects the way things generally are. I mean, there are lots of little offices spread around the area. Their uh, larger ventures have to go through some kind of site plan review. Uh, it, uh, some of these specific things have never come up. I mean, the chances of anyone building large retail seem pretty remote here. Mm -hmm. The difference is uh, in the past and, and to the to the moment, our provisions for businesses outside of the business, you know, a, a property zone for business has been the home occupations provision. 
where if you if there's no evidence that it's there, there's no uh, it's it's allowed by right. Uh, and if there is evidence, you know, if, if, uh, then then it's supposed to be um, there's supposed to be uh, I think a special permit. But well, the special permits I plan review pretty much same difference um, from my perspective. Uh, what we what happens though, and and what we need to deal with, I think, in, in looking at the businesses going forward, is that uh, why should a business that's okay as a home occupation um, not be okay if it isn't? Um, which is to say, if somebody rents somebody's barn to to conduct a you know woodworking operation or a pottery studio or leatherworking or a forge or any any of those things, you know artisanal um, businesses. Um, why is it okay if it's a homeowner, but not okay if it's somebody else doing it? And I personally don't think it, it should, I think it should be okay. If, the type of business should be okay, regardless of whether or not it's, it's conducted as a sideline by somebody who lives there. Is there an assumption at all that a home occupation involves no one but the, the homeowner and, and family? No, there isn't, because the, uh, the, one of the things we've done is we put a lid on how big it can get by by setting uh, how many employees it can have. That that's in our current code. Yes. And what is that limit? I don't remember. Well, do you, is do you remember, David? Is it is I believe it two, it's three. three? Is uh, there an assumption that? Is there? An assumption, yeah, I'm looking to be what is special about homeowners. Is there an assumption? I'm sorry about about home occupations. Is there an assumption that there is no external evidence of that occupation? Well, no, that's why there's two classes of home occupations. The ones that you can't tell are there and the ones that you can. Well, oh, I can sorry, you. I say that again. There, there are two classes of home occupation. The ones, uh, the ones you can't, the ones where there is no evidence and the ones where there is. And the ones where there is require, um, I, think, I forget what's a special permit or a site plan approval, but I think it's a special permit. You're supposed to go to the planning board for when it when it when it's that kind of business. It, uh, would that would that translate to the expectation that people will be <clears throat> customers will be visiting the home occupation? Right. Well, it includes that possibility. I mean, it can be it could be either, uh, for instance, a contractor who has equipment, um, and then you end up with a whole yard full of uh, you know, industrial you know whatever equipment parked and that has a you know, it changes the character of the neighborhood, <laughs> or or it could be the kind of business that draws customers. Um, but I think that's the flaw. Traffic. If it draws customers, then it's not a home occupation. Well, yeah, either I would go, I would agree with you, Rhonda, and but I'd say either way, if you've got a yard full of construction equipment that is beyond what a homeowner might keep, just you know, your your single uh, front end loader or something. Um, then it becomes not a home occupation. There's external evidence of some kind. And I think that's a distinction that, that we could reasonably make. But I we, sent but you a definition, now. Joel, of, the, well, of the, the Small Business Administration's definition of a home occupation. And we should be going by that. And what is that? Well, I'd have to dig it out again, but it, it was definitely very, you know, in home. <laughs> And, and not customers and things like that. Once you start opening your home to, to customers or patients or something like clients, then it's a whole different story. It hasn't been treated that way in Danby historically. Yeah, how do you have much of a business without customers? Yeah. And um, for example, well, Toby, do you have customers? You have a business. I have a business and I have plenty of clients, no, but no. nobody comes to my door. No, no, but, if you were, but, if you were, but if you were doing, as we had, for instance, in West Danby, we had somebody who was making lawn ornaments for a while. Um, you, you, know, you, you, he, you know, he, he would put them out and then uh, with a little for sale sign and people um, who were into lawn ornaments would stop by and, and, uh, and buy them. You know, but that's you, what, why I told you that the person on 96B who is running these uh, weekend uh, sales of antiques and other things, that's, that's just somebody who's using their yard as a retail site, not somebody who's running a home business. Yeah, no, no, that's a home um, business. Yeah. 
Yeah, can we give Toby? I'm curious to see the what Toby had yeah, well, to say. Uh, well, Catherine has her hand up too. I'd like to okay. hear what Catherine has to say. She has to unmute herself first, however. There we go. So <clears throat> a home, there's Vince and Kathleen on Yaple Road have a big sign. Other than that, you can't tell anything. I assume that he could have customers. And there are lots of places. So I think what happens here is what I'm hearing, and I sort of have felt as we go through this process, is that the people in Danby are waking up or realizing that any regulation that comes along could affect them in a future thing that they might want to do with their property or people that they know. And they're thinking in terms of maybe these things aren't so terrible as long as we our, our regulations for how they do it are a little protective. It, 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 it's going to be very complicated. But the idea of saying no to everything, I think is where we might be getting some of these responses. So going through saying, well, I don't want this or I don't want that is part of how we're gonna come around to how can we do these things. Yeah, I agree. Um, Corbett has her hand up too. There we go. Um, hi, yeah, I mean, so I have been working out of my house for the last nine years, um, providing consulting services. And um, for the last four years, we've been on the art trail and we don't have like retail customers coming on a regular basis, but you know, there are some Saturdays and then two weekends in October where we're open to the public. Um, and I think personally think that that's a perfectly reasonable uh, use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got somebody down the road for me that, who does that as well. Two of them, I think. Well, Toby? I had, Corbett, I had given that your situation some thought. And I think that an artist who is making pottery or painting, uh, it, there are certain limits to that. And I don't see any problem with you being on the art trail and people coming on a Saturday to see what you have and to buy it. Uh, what where it turns into something different is where you have something like Brian Keeler, who actually has a gallery. So I mean, his house is a gallery, and he's it's open anytime he's there. And that's a whole different story in my business, my opinion, because it's more like a shop. He's turned his house into a gallery. Why is that a problem? It's the amount of traffic that it generates. So you could generate that much traffic? Uh, I think he does because he he encourages people to come and look at his art and he's quite well known. So people would do that. It's just like any other gallery. It's like the gallery on, you know, the state of the art on State Street. Perhaps the distinguishing factor in that case is that he has a space set aside for no other use but displaying his product. But Corbett does too. Do you? So the distinction that our current zoning makes is that the traffic should be no more than is reasonably expected in a residential neighborhood. Now, I think that is a fairly good and flexible metric I think a lot of people are confused about how much traffic is normal in a residential neighborhood. It's not abnormal for 10 people to drive by your house in a residential neighborhood or to have five people in a day show up at your house and visit you. Those are all completely reasonable amounts of traffic. Shouldn't even call it traffic. It's not traffic. It's just people coming to your house. Did you mean 10 people at one time? No, in a day. In a day? Yeah. It happens. Well, yeah. It, happens at, it happens at your house, Ted, regularly. Yeah. I mean, 10 people in a day. I mean, any road gets hundreds of people a day, even a deserted one. Well, maybe not Howland Road. Well, you know, <laughs> you, you tend to have less of that in like a, a you know, a, a dead end street and then a through street. But uh, 
Uh, like I probably don't get a whole lot of traffic on Fieldstone Circle or down in uh, Buttermilk Lane either, but. Uh, right, and, and even on my section of Comfort Road, which is becoming known as a thoroughfare for certain purposes, uh, a car every few minutes is, is about it. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, we've got a lot more traffic in that in station. In, yeah, in, I'm sure you do. Way more than in 3496, but uh, well, that's uh, yeah. So, so the, the the problem then is what is reasonable in in a residential neighborhood depends on which residential neighborhood you're in. If we had something that was more specific, perhaps that would be very useful. Hey, Corbett, well, I mean, has their hand up. Yes, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Um. So you can't tell people not to have parties. And some people like to have parties, you know, frequently. Right. Party yep. people. Yep. Yep. I hear you. I think so that when you're talking about a business, uh, for example, my neighbor across the road um, is a midwife. And she was thinking of having, uh, she was working out of Planned Parenthood and some other places uh, and was thinking of, using her house to do her business instead that meant that people would be coming to her house for particular business purposes whether they were being examined or whether they were actually in labor or whatever now she decided against that and chose a different location but you know i I would object with the definition that, well, it has to be, uh, has to have traffic that is normal to a residential area because I have seen traffic at her house and when she has some classes and stuff and all kinds of other people coming and going, it's as busy as any doctor's office. And that's, I, I think that's way too much. Well, I mean, the people weren't didn't have any problem with doctors' offices either. As I recall that category. Yep. All right. So, what, what do we want to do with this? Um, should I put together a present uh, a set of allowed uses um, for our next meeting and um, discuss? Look at that. Um, you know. Based this, these parameters are a starting point. I'm continuing to collect feedback. I don't expect it to change dramatically. Um, I don't either. I mean, it, it, there seems to be a sense, there seems to be a willingness to tolerate a, a diversity of businesses uh, with varying degrees of, of site plan approval to ensure their, their compatibility, I guess you could say. Um, so I would. I would think any regulations we would we would we would want included would would have those two features that that, that they're for, for uh, that the, the site plan review criteria would reflect the potential for the impacts um, and, and and their mitigation so that you know there, there, there's both there's traffic impacts and there's also visual impacts mm -hmm. and um, we can deal you know. Mm -hmm. I think our current, although, the, although our criteria may not be well defined, our current distinction between home occupations and not home occupations is an important distinction. And we should try and codify exactly what the limits are of a home occupation and basically say, home occupation, we don't care as long as health department or whoever it is, is okay with it. And once it crosses that borderline, then it becomes regulated as a small business. Well, I mean, we have no, uh, right now, the, the, the class home occupation has, the only limit it's got is, 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 is based on the number of employees. I think that's the wrong way to do it. Yeah, I, I think that we, that might be one, set, one of a set of criteria, but I think there are others in external, external, um, appearances, traffic to it, whether or not it's intended as a, as a showroom, so to speak, that's tra same as traffic. You could um, have someone who's running a billing service and yeah. they will operate for doctors and dentists and it might be three people 
in a in a home situation and they would have no one coming to the door nothing and you would have no uh, exterior impression that there was even a business going on uh, and yet they're conducting um, a significant amount of business uh, so I that why would that be a problem? what's the problem with that yeah that, that's there the is no thing. problem with that so that's what that's what, uh, that's what Joel said earlier that already there's the distinction between one that has no external impact and one that does have an external impact. That's already the distinction we make in our regulations. That makes a good thing to keep that distinction there and still can be a home sure. business. Sure, and I, I wonder whether your small professional office, such as your, I mean, wh where like a doctor, dentist, where that kind of office fits into that scheme. Is it is it unregulated or should it be regulated? I think that we should discuss that one. Well, I mean, I think it, I think it should be regulated in the same way. Um, there was some concern, and I think it's fair, you know, about scale. You know, it's one thing to say to have a doctor's office, which might have, you know, if there was a single practice, which is increasingly uncommon, but, you know, in mm -hmm. the old days, it was not so uncommon where you have an office and you've got a you've got a receptionist and maybe there's a nurse uh, and you've got people coming and going that's different than having an office complex where you've got you know multiple physicians in a single practice and uh you know, you know you've got a receptionist and you've got a, you know a billing agent and you've got you know so forth and so forth you may end up having you know eight or ten people working out of it um right well that that becomes an office not you know not a professional services and again, that back to the, the survey, the point at which it becomes an, an office <laughs> with cubicles and multiple people on it, that's a, another important distinction that we have to make. Um, well, I didn't see that distinction being made in, this, in these questions, or maybe I just- Because, because I don't think it, what an office is, it was clearly my first take on it. And I'd heard the discussion that we had here. My first take was office, oh, doctor. That's okay. And then I said, wait a minute, that all the office could also mean something else. And since I didn't know, yeah, my first answer was wrong. Well, it was wrong or not, but it, 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 well, it wasn't. There's that, I, there's that, there's that, um, the, the, the answers that people made will no doubt be colored by what they imagine in their mind when they're, when they're thinking about it. Precisely um, my point. Yeah. But I mean, uh, scale is an issue. I mean, you know, what's what's okay on a small scale isn't necessarily okay when you when when on, on a larger scale. Yeah. For, you know, for, you know, it's, it's one thing to make artisanal cheeses in your in your in your commercial kitchen, uh, and another thing to have a cheese factory. So if you're doing the work yourself. Producing the product. Who cares? What's that? If you're doing the work yourself, who cares how much space you're using as long as your sales room isn't right there. And you your deliveries, your delivery truck is of the kind that isn't easily distinguishable from the rest of the neighborhood traffic. Yeah. I, so. I, it worries me that we're trying to make too many rules here. <clears throat> and um, if we look at when you said that about a small dairy or cheese, I was thinking about, I think it's Side Hill, the one that's down there in Cander area. Mm -hmm. they, they do have a little tiny retail place um, and they, but they also have the, a full goat farm. So now we're talking about, when you talk about cheeses and things, aren't we talking about an agricultural business? Right. And we you know, better be careful about that. Then- We um, can't regulate those. Agriculture does complicate it, yes. Roadside well, stands. Farm stands. We can yeah. still do site plan review for those things. So, right. But remember, remember that site plan review cannot turn anything down if it meets the criteria. That's why right. the next step is making sure the criteria is right. adequate. That's and, that, and that's what gets into lots of little niggling rules, which may be what we have to do. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, we should at least have basic. Uh, address the, the main concerns that arise in any business in any neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, okay. noise, light, traffic, and, I think it would and, be, and, and visual impacts. I think external. it would be wise for us to at least have some basic parameters 
and then still say that it would be dependent on, on, on the proposed activity and other criteria. Uh, but to be hard and fast on, on certain criteria and, and then just cut it off right there means that somebody who would come along and maybe have something a little bit more invasive would get away with it. I mean, it, it's a big difference between the whole business of saying that you're operating an electric business out of your home and then all of a sudden building a huge pole barn. Yeah, I, I'm not so much concerned about uh, what you're doing. I'd hate, to, I'd hate to be trying to make rules that says you can cut cheese, but you can't cut wood, for example. Um, I, I hate to make the distinction of what, it's more what its effect on what? surrounding neighborhood yes. is. Yeah, I think that's right. It's effect on the, effect on the neighborhood, which is why the criteria should address the potential impacts of traffic, visual impacts, uh, and noise are the biggies. Light. Light to a lesser extent, but I mean it's not it's not insignificant, but it's it's uh, it's not as important as, as I would say the others. Yeah, I, I actually think light is really a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I have lived where people have uh, you know, there's a gas station nearby that every single thing is lit up all night, all day, and the car wash is lit up and light into the yes. sky at night. Right, right, right. So right. light is the problem. Right. So light, light, light. Light's probably, new yeah. noise can be intermittent, but light is steady. We yeah. still have to follow the uh, comprehensive plan. So if we're trying to, whatever is being done needs to, work within the comprehensive plan and we preserve the rural character of the town, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for what it's worth, you know, Catherine is quite correct that light is, is constant and we would never want a junkyard, okay? I'm not proposing a junkyard, but one of the, one of the, category, one of the things that makes a junkyard bad is that it has to be, let's say, it has to be lit up all night to keep vandals out. No, I don't, I don't recall the ones that we have had being lit up all night. Well, they were trash heaps, not junkyards. <laughs> and they didn't have the junkyard dog. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's why it's a, I think it's a safe example because we don't have one. But now try to ask the question, okay, what kind of business would require being lit up all night, like a gas station or a junkyard or, or something? And then the light does become an issue. In most cases, it's not an issue. So anyway, if we if we if we take those four characteristics into account in our site plan review, and require site plan review for those businesses that are conspicuous, you know, you can tell they're there. Um, I don't. I personally don't think we should be distinguishing between those which originate as home occupations and those which do not. What's the downside in in distinguishing between them? Well, the downside is that is the, is the situation you get in, for instance. Somebody builds a, a, a building to accommodate their woodworking passion, okay? They have a business. Uh, they, um, they prosper for a while or not, uh, and then they retire to Virginia or Florida. Okay, so somebody else buys the house. That was awfully specific, Joel. Yeah, <laughs> somebody else buys the house. And then, uh, and then you've got this facility that was constructed for a purpose, uh, and uh, you know, it, why shouldn't it be available for somebody else to use for the same purpose? If if if, at, if that person at, doesn't happen to be the one who buys the house, at the same scale. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same building, you know, used for the same purpose by somebody else other than the homeowner. Now it was okay as long as it was the homeowner using it, because then it was accessory to the dwelling and it was a home occupation. But if this, but if the if the same facility doing the same thing gets rented to somebody else by a new owner, it's no longer a home occupation and it's technically illegal under our zoning. Well, well what not, if though the person? Definition. What if the person wasn't mm -hmm. was doing something? 
a little bit different. Um, you're, you're using an example where you're saying that the woodworking is a home occupation. I really wouldn't call that a home occupation. That's not what a home occupation is. A home occupation is supposed to be inside the home, not in some other buildings that are on the same property as the home. Well, that's the way oh. we have defined it in Danby no, and for that's the last not 40 years. Correct. You yeah, must well, define it according to the Small Business Administration. That, that's why that's I not the way we from... defined it in Danby for the last 40 years. That doesn't mean maybe we shouldn't be doing it that way, but that's what we have been doing. And nobody has had any real problem with the way we have been dealing with it. Yeah. Until that, now. That's why I wanted to well, hear and from Even Toby. now, people don't have a problem. I mean, the, the problem that we've got, as I see it, is that the kind of businesses that we think are okay as home occupations, um, we technically don't allow if they're not. So we so have why? a construction company right there in the hamlet, and we have Brian Lamort right down the road, and, and they're good examples of why that doesn't work. Nobody can not. About them except for you. Right. Let, let me just say that, that the discussion you're having now is precisely why I wanted Toby to describe his situation. He has his woodworking shop in a barn separate from his house. It, you know, it, it simply wouldn't fit into a reasonable house. But yet, it's a quiet place. It's just him. I don't know if he has an, one employee. I'm sure he doesn't have many more. Um, he doesn't have visitors that I've ever been aware of. Uh, you're down the street from him now, Catherine. You, you might know better. He's fine. He's invisible. And I well, I've no seen Mark Spicer's place, and I would call it a separate business from his home. It is not in his home, and it is, it's not even attached to his home. It no, is it's not. It, it's not. And, it's, and unlike Toby, he actually has visitors. Toby. <laughs> Sorry, broke up. Yeah, you're breaking up, Catherine. So. Yeah, I think uh, now you're, you're freezing as well. It sounds to me like, sorry, I won't speak. Um, so, so, so we only heard a couple of words. Put it, put it in the chat so we can see it. I'm at it. Okay. I don't need to speak. It's okay. Okay. I don't need. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Oh, oh, good, because you can't take it out. <laughs> yeah. I think we can move forward. Um, I don't think we need to talk about the commercial uses anymore. I think we've digested what's in the survey and I'll incorporate um, that and the feedback that we've had as a group into a proposal for next uh, meeting um, and to, to move forward. Uh, I think we can start looking at the table. Yeah, let's do that. At, at start looking at what, excuse me? The, the table. table. Which we got through one row of last. Oh, week. the table. We need yes, the table. Finish. We need to finish this um, or we will be significantly off schedule. Um, yes, so indeed. I'd like to keep our conversation fairly specific to what changes someone would like to make and we can discuss that change and see, you know, uh, take a quick poll of the group. Do people want to discuss that more or do people just completely disagree with your suggestion um, so that we can move somewhat efficiently and not get bogged down? Um, yeah. So let me share the screen <laughs> currently. Here we go. All right. Does this bring back warm, fuzzy memories? Yeah, except it's it's allegedly small though. Um, and let me share it the other way. By the way, there was a a house um, on seventy nine to not just a house, but multiple houses on seventy nine today in Slaterville Springs that were situated within ten feet of the highway. And I definitely didn't like them. And they, there was a sidewalk there and a curb. 
And so what you had was this house that almost exited, uh, you know, from the front door, exited out onto the street. Um, and there was no place for landscaping or trees or anything like this. So the house was very much sort of in your face. And it, I suppose they could have put up some annual plants around the foundation of the house or something like that, but they chose not to do that. So I, I definitely don't like this whole business of situating houses within 10 feet of the road. Rhonda, I'm shocked by your feelings on that. Why? Yeah, I'm joking. It, it's not shocking at all. It's not surprising. Um, we have four rows to get through and last week we finished row four, which I have changed to low density residential because we decided we were keeping the rules basically the same and that the name suburban neighborhood wasn't working for people. I'm gonna go with low density residential. The next zone is the rural two zone, um, which we have proposed with an average density of one unit per 10 acres, um, either small lots or more than 10 acre size lots, 20 foot um, front or side yard, 200 rear, um, and a setback from clusters. One of the things that I feel like I heard um, in, sorry, I'm gonna change the way this is showing so you can see it better, hopefully. All right. Uh, one of the things that I, I heard was concern about um, how we maintain space between um, lots. And I think it's important to distinguish between um, the large lots and the small lots. And in conversation with Guy, he suggested that what we should do is have the minimum lot size be 10 acres and then have included in the table the way that you can do cluster. So the way our current zoning works, um, you have to have a minimum size of two acres or you can cluster and then there's just no rules. Rather than being completely open, we can um, have the parameters for how clustering works, uh, which I think would be really helpful because right now cluster, we have had some really weird things be considered clustering because the only criteria for being a cluster right now is being more than five acres. Um, and then you can basically propose anything. And it is uh, discretionary whether or not to approve it, but it's very unclear. Mm -hmm. Um, I did. What's the, what's the difference between, I mean, uh, our rural one and rural two, the distinguishing feature? Uh, so the, I guess it's not shown on this table, but one of the distinguishing features was that rural, one, I believe it was one. Um, yeah, rural one um, over here all buildings are subject to site plan review. Um, any non-agricultural building goes through site plan review. And for rural two, um, only buildings with four um, or more units would have site plan review. Um, basically right now, houses never have site plan review. Mm -hmm. But you had said also that there was some physical distinct distinction between rural area one and two. There's a distinction in why things are in rural one or rural two, which right, is that right. rural one is areas that have um, UNAs, steep slopes, lots of wetlands. It's basically yeah. the, the more- the, the, dark, the dark green as opposed to the hatch green. Yes. Yeah. Oh, the light green as opposed to the hatch green. The dark green is All right. high priority. All right, yeah. Uh, you'll notice there are also difference in this chart, and perhaps we'll be discussing this, there are also differences in the, the yard set, the setbacks, the yards, and the transfer development rights. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Um, right. And could I, could I raise one issue that, that I mentioned, I've mentioned it before, but it does sort of become important when you think long-term. 
um, is it possible to have yard setbacks or cluster setbacks or whatever it is be set permanently for a property as of the moment this this um, uh, this zoning is enacted and look at those separately let's say a, a lot that is divided into smaller lots the setbacks would then be the maximum of the greater of the original setbacks and the setbacks of the divided lots uh, in other words that makes me. that makes the um the setback predictable for the neighbors no matter what it happens to this lot you know to the lot where the, the subject lot no matter how it's carved up divided no matter what the setbacks will never change for from the neighbor's point of view I guess I didn't understand what you were proposing, Ted. You, okay, could, let's say you again? start with let's say you start with a hundred acre lot. Okay, um, it has certain setbacks. As as a, as a hundred acre lot, yeah. As a hundred acre lot, you divide it up into you run a road down the middle of it, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. you and you divide it into let let's just say for example ten lots on each side of the road into twenty lots. The lots are not only smaller, but their orientation has changed. So what was a rear yard becomes a side yard. Mm -hmm. And for the neighbor, that makes a big difference between somebody who can build within 300 feet of your property line and someone who can build within 20 feet of your property line. On the other hand, what I'm suggesting is that the, uh, the setbacks of the original lot sort of form a, you know, a, a gray area, around, a border around that lot. And no matter how you subdivide it afterwards, you still can't, those, those setbacks still hold. It basically forces the owner of that lot to subdivide in such a way as not to change the predictability from the point of view of the neighbor. Are you talking about a building envelope, something in that, like that? Uh, in, in effect, in effect, yes. I mean, just imagine that the, the, that every lot in town by this zoning that, that we see here is going to have a gray border where you can't build because of setbacks. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, no matter how you cut that lot up, that gray border will never get smaller. It might get larger, but it's unlikely to. But it will never get smaller. I like that. Is there I think that's what this column G, the cluster setback from well, that, lots was intended that, to address. Once upon a time, once upon a time that that sort of meant that, but now it only has to do with cluster setbacks. In, yeah, I mean, what what uh, what didn't what didn't hold up under scrutiny was my proposal for a three hundred foot separation distance. Between between houses, period. Which between I can between see why that's between, a be, between new and existing, and and uh, that was problematic because it meant that what happened on one lot was going to affect what happened on the adjoining one. Right. Uh, Whereas what I'm proposing is totally self-created hardship. If you decide to cut it up, you may find yourself in a situation where you have less, but your neighbor it has nothing to do with your neighbor except that it protects the neighbor. Yeah, yeah. No, that, uh, I think the idea has merit. I'm not sure how one would. I'm you know, sorry, I missed the up, beginning, but... of, oh, beginning okay. of this, but I was calling into question the whole concept of front, rear, and side. If you're, if you're, first of all, if you have a two-acre lot with a 300-foot setback, there's no place to build. Um, and second of all, it, uh, front, rear, and side sort of. Assume you're talking about a rectangular lot perpendicular to the road. If you're talking about a trapezoidal lot that's at the end of a driveway as a cluster of lots, front, rear, and side don't really make any sense anymore. David, you addressed that before. You want to bring it up again? Um, I'm, well, I'm not sure we really have talked about that directly um what i what i see here lynn saying is that you should just have the same setback for all sides because what 
the concern is um, is the impact on a neighbor. And he's saying it doesn't matter if the neighbor's on the side or behind, he wants the same distance. Um, the problem is that to be fair, then you've, you've got to go to the smaller one from Lynn's point of view. And I think he's right on this. You couldn't have a 200 foot rear yard setback because it would have, you couldn't have 200 feet on every side, could you? Reasonably. Well, no, I mean, no, it would be a lot more than an acre, two acres if you did that. Two acre exactly. lots only 300 feet by 300 feet. So exactly. You'd have to go for fairly small yards, which in turn fly against the intent to try and keep people from getting too dense. Well, the clusters, though, we, 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 we're not trying to keep people from being dense in a cluster. If, if it was a cluster, you know, where I'm thinking cluster, Whitehall. Yeah. That, yes, but what you're really talking about is any, a cluster could be any division, unless you define cluster as something specific. The column G is now a cluster, meaning any subdivision into a multiple, one lot into multiple lots, not necessarily close together houses. Uh, or David, am I wrong? This is what you meant? Um, the cluster is using the option to have the small lot. So in the rural one and two, that's going to two acres or less with the lots that you're subdividing off. So if you had 10, if you had 10, my example, 100 acres being divided into 10 or 20 acre lots, then it would not apply, you're saying it would not apply to that cluster setback? No, that's well, not a cluster. It's not a cluster if they're ten, ten acre lots. But so, you can only have one residential unit uh, in that section. I, I don't know how, how do we get clustering? Right, you, but, all, but all of a sudden, because you, you might actually turn the lot from one direction to another by the presence of a new development road, you have you you basically have changed conditions dramatically. I, this is not a this is not a simple question. Mm. No, well, I I'd like to move on from from this discussion and get to the actual table because we are now almost halfway through this hour. Um, sure. Let's not forget it though. Yeah. Well, why would we move on and not get finished discussing this? Well, we're, we're not we're only moving on from that. We're still going to discuss. That. Yeah, because we have other things to talk about, too. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the current layout for Rural 1 and Rural 2 um, does have smaller setbacks for front and side than um, below density residential. Mm -hmm. And this is something that several people had questions about, and it's something we may end up changing um, based on the consensus of the group. Um, but I wanted to share why um, you would do that with some examples, uh, pictures that I took of rural places that do not have large setbacks. They also don't have more than one house on them. <laughs> These are all, I don't think anyone would say that this isn't rural. It's definitely not suburban. Um, because the lots are so large, because we're requiring such a low density overall, um, having a small setback isn't really the kind of impact that it would be when the lots were smaller, you have a lot more of them close together. So but that's my reasoning those... behind it. We don't need to stick with it. It's my suggestion. Um, I think some people in the group would like to propose other things, and I think we can discuss that. None of yeah, those they're... pictures that you showed had any other houses around those barns, other than the house of the owner. The one was buyers. That's... Okay, I, it's not worth going in that direction. I can tell you lots of them had other houses nearby, um, but it's not a competition. We need to figure out what the group is comfortable with as 
parameters for these zones. One of the considerations here was for the lots less than two acres. Um, if you were going to do a, a tight cluster like an eco village, um, you would, it, unless we unless we say that the cluster is not subject to the same rules, uh, was that your intention, David? So currently, clusters have no rules and have the option of getting around all um, setbacks, lot sizes, etc. In our current code. Um, so that's one way to deal with it. So then you could propose, you know, quarter acre lots or tenth of an acre lots, if necessary, if if you wanted to, like um, which shared services to do an eco village um, using the cluster provision, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be constrained to have a setback, so it'd be you know, ten feet or twenty feet, um, right for for any of the lots created. But yep. if you don't do a cluster, then you're talking about, uh, well, if you don't do a cluster, you're talking about a 10 acre or more lot. Yep. So you, yep. Let, me, yep. let me suggest an example. Let's say you have a 10 acre lot, which is about 600 feet on a side. That's, that would be nine acres, um, 660 feet, pick a number. You know. Yeah. Um, and next to it, there are houses on either side at, at the normal 50 foot setback, the side yard setback that we have. You could take your 10 acre lot and divide off, uh, divide off two, tell me where I'm, where I'm going wrong. You could you divide, divide off two. You can't divide a 10 acre lot. You can't divide it at all. You can't no, divide no, it no. at all. You can't even divide an 18 acre lot. You have to have 20 acres to have two lots. Well, that's that's interesting. Do you think you're going to get some pushback on that? We'll see. Yeah, this is where we're at. Yeah. So, so I, have I have a question, um, and I'll give this example. Under rural residential one, there's two acre lots, less than two acres or more than 10. And I apologize for not having been more on top of this beforehand. Um, how can you have a less than two acre lot in, in uh, the rural residential one? Is it you have 50 acres and you break off one tiny lot and sell it? There, there's, the fount, there's, there's where I misunderstood you, David. Um, if you had a 10 acre lot, lot or less than 20 acre lot by what you just told me, you could not create new two acre lots. So you need 10 acres for every lot on average. Right. You could Yeah, well the thing is that yeah, what about on average? Because if you if you have if you've got hundred acres, you're entitled to 10. Yes. Now do the do the 10 so you're saying that unless the lot is 10 acres or more, it has to be in a cluster. That's well, not obvious from the table. That you couldn't yeah. create a two a two acre lot, and then if you, you take multiple two acre lots, and then have a residual parcel, right? What is a cluster? And and so, in your yeah, current, but if you do it one acre, but if you do it one lot at a time, it's not a cluster. Right. And in your current drawing of rural one and rural two, there are I presume very few lots less than ten acres, so that new new two acre lots could be created only by the subdivision of lots that are very that are 20 acres or more right now. Um, I agree with the second part. I disagree that there aren't a lot of lots smaller than 10 acres. I think there are, but um, yes, somewhat beside the point. Of... Well, you but they're un, they're indivisible. I'm talking I'm talking about in a Is it divisible lots Absolutely. they're indivisible lots because they're 10 acres or less yeah right those are indivisible right. so, so, what's, so re what's, a, what's relevant is the divisible ones right, right. so what well, adding would read redoing the wording in the uh rural residentials one and two in that category to relate somehow to to the creation of clusters be uh make things clearer 
Yeah, it seems to me that that would make a lot more sense, it, which means Maybe. you don't really have column C. You only have exceptions for clusters and then have details on clusters. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah. That was Guy's suggestion. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I mean, found it, it, it wasn't really what, confusing. I don't think that's what we were talking about when we put this together, but it's, but it's, but it's, but Guy's suggestion is that we, it is that, that that's how we do it, which is to say, is the lot three the 10 acres or they're clustered if they're going to be less? Right. Right, which means we don't have column C there at all. Or and we, we don't have people going, oh, I, I'm going to do a half acre lot, you know, on my, my property. It looks like I can do that. Yeah, they still can as long as they have 10 acres per lot. So if they want two lots, right. they have, to have 20 acres. It can be a two acre lot and an 18 acre lot. And then that's 10 acres per lot. Right, call, and then they're done. call that a cluster? Yeah. Okay, well, that's the, that's the thing that-, that, that uh, It's not, not a cluster. Obvious. Yeah. Under I mean, our current zoning, that is a cluster. Well, yeah. I know, of course, of course that, that has also been problematic because it was- uh, what, what, I think is, what I think is different about that that makes it a cluster compared to what we currently allow we would currently allow a eight acre lot and a 12 acre lot to be considered a cluster. Um, whereas the point of clustering is having small lots so that you preserve large lots. So I don't think it makes a difference that you only have two lots in the cluster as long as you're making a small lot to preserve a larger lot. Um, I think frequently clusters will be more than- How does the development rights transfer figure into this? So, I mean, how many units it can have in a lot? Right. The development rights transfer um, is based on how many rights to units you have. So you have a unit per 10 acres. So say you had 100 acres, you have rights to 10 units. Maybe you have one house on it already, so you have nine rights left. If you wanted to sell those rights um, to another parcel, you could. Um, but if you wanted or, to buy those rights to have more than 10? Yeah, yeah, so there's a limit on how many rights you can transfer into a lot based on the zone, which is another difference between the zones. So in rural one, you can only add one development right to a lot um, because Got we it. really want that to be a relatively low density zone. But mm -hmm. I think allowing one right transferring in does make sense. Um, the development and, rights refers to units on a lot, not number of lots you can create. Is that right? It can be, it can go both ways. You can create a, a lot or just add a unit to the same lot. Um, so just, if you bought to, development rights, you could put more than two things in a 20 acre. Right. Correct. Yep, but you can only buy one. In, in, uh, in a rural one. Yeah. Uh, just just to make sure that we're not headed down a road that leads to problems, let's say that you bought as many development rights as you could, but chose to keep to put all of the dwellings on one lot. You could do that. Let's say you did that. Um, okay. Which zone are you that, talking about, Ted? Say again. Which zone are you talking about? Uh, let's use rural one. But okay. It, so the most development rights you can buy is one. No, did I say, wait a minute, let's get this, let me scroll over. Rural two, excuse me, the the the, the less protected one. Okay. okay, rural two. Okay, so let's say you transfer in as many as you can, whatever it is. It's yeah. four. You want to build a fourplex, say, or whatever. Right, and you put them all on one lot. How do, will that get us into trouble if at some time in the future, someone want, someone actually wants to subdivide the lot just to break off one house or two or all of them. Could you end up with a situation where you simply cannot draw the lots <laughs> properly? Wait, then it's not subdividable. Why not? You're, you, you, let's say it was- Because uh, they're too small to begin with. Well, okay, let's have a 40 acre, 40 acre lot in rural two and you transfer in three, so now you've got 
the right to build four, which can all be on one lot. Yeah. Are you making life trouble difficult for yourself if the if the owner decides to transfer the ownership to the individual houses? I don't think you are. I I'm think just saying what's the worst case. You're I think you're not having a problem at all. You're avoiding a problem. We currently have a big problem with that. If somebody wants to um, build a house for a relative on their lot, we require them to do it in a way that they could subdivide in the future. And there's really no need for that. They can just allow them to have a second house on the lot. It's not a problem um, to need to subdivide. No one needs to subdivide. Well, if they want to set it up in a way that it's not subdividable in the future, then it's not subdividable in the future. It's, it's not well, really a that, big issue. That's, that's exactly the nature of my question. It's not whether they need to, they might want to at some time in the future. Well, it then it does can't. Yeah, it, 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 they know that when they rules. buy into it. For, ex for example, um, we have one, one lot, builds, subdivide, doesn't subdivide, but builds four houses, parents and three kids. Parents die, house is sold to a, a separate party. Kids begin to move elsewhere. So now you end up with four separate parties on a shared lot. Wouldn't it be natural for them to want to subdivide at that point? They might want to, but they wouldn't be able to. Ah, so you're so you're willing to say you simply can't. You're going to have to co-own that that plot of land somehow. Yeah, lots of people that, own a fourplex or own multiple units. If if that's what it is, that's what it is. How do you? I'm not saying they own four that? units. I'm saying each owns one unit. They don't own them if it's one lot. Right. How do you keep track of all of this so that? 50 or 100 years down the road, you know that the property is not subdividable anymore. That's a good we, question. We include Doesn't it, it go in the deed? We put it on the plat, the final plat that is the official survey that's filed with the town clerk that anyone who buys the lot with in the future. Ah, uh, yes. The same location that you would put, say, a, an access easement for a neighbor. Um, when it's on the plat, every future buyer is knows about it and sees it and has notice of it. And every future action, you look back at the plat and see what's allowed for that parcel. It's, it's a good answer, but and, and maybe I'm picking a bad example, but we just finished with a large plot on Marsh Road, Marsh and Deputron, yeah. where, where we ran into that exact problem where something that had been large was being subdivided, the rules were changing, and well, in this case, there was a means to, to get the result they wanted, but had they not been able to find that means, they would be stuck with their original lot. They could not subdivide it. Well, I mean, they I'm had just... the right, there was no, uh, the, 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 under the existing rules, they had the right to subdivide into something like 23. But they had no road frontage and therefore they had no right to build until okay, we, we are definitely off topic that's off, that's off topic i'm afraid <laughs> um, well the part that's on topic i'm not talking about marsh specifically the part that's on topic is the question could we be creating a nightmare for ourselves in the future and i don't think so no i don't think so either David, what format does this plat take at this point in time? I think I remember way back when, before computers, it was actually a paper form, right? Or something like that. What does, what uh, format does this whole town plat design take at this point in time? It's still paper. It's filed with the county and with the town, it's paper get signed by the planning board chair when they approve the subdivision with a real pen. Hmm. Um, they do get scanned frequently. I'm, I don't know how the county stores them. But. but there's no chance of it ever getting permanently destroyed or something. No. I mean, there's always a chance of something getting permanently destroyed, but it's not very likely. No more chance than a deed. I think it's, it's better than a deed because you actually look at it. 
Um, so maybe we could get back to the um, setbacks and the other parameters past setbacks on the table. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I heard complaints from several people that they didn't like the 20 feet or the 10 feet um, for front yards. I showed the examples of how I see that fre frequently happening in rural places, especially with large lots. But does somebody want to propose something else that people like more? Well, I'd like to point out that it appeared to me that all the pictures that you showed were showing town roads. And South Danby Road is a county road. And uh, I think there's a difference of traffic and everything else. I think it would be really hard to do on a county road, and particularly hard. These are, these are not build to lines, Rhonda. They're minimum setbacks. If somebody builds on a county road or a state road, they're apt to want the house farther back. If they choose to put them close to the road, that's that that's their choice. Um, we're 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 allowing for the possibility, and 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 you know these setbacks apply to any road in the town, state highway, county road, town road, irrespective. And you know the probability is that nobody's going to build very close to the road unless they're on a town road, less well traveled. A lot of the houses that are close to the road now were built when the roads that they were on were, were a lot less traveled than they are currently. And not only that, um, the roads were a lot narrower than they are currently. The houses you were alluding to earlier in, 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 in Slaterville and in, in other places, and in the Danby the same way, some of them end up really close to the highway. Well, they weren't built that close to the highway, the highway got wider. You know, I, I see this, I saw it happen in Dryden when they widened the road, uh, Rudin Road 13 coming in, you know, people lost you know, 10 feet of their front yards, all of a sudden the houses are way closer to the road than they were before. Well, you know, 100 years ago, they didn't have sidewalks and tree lawns and curbs and parking out lanes and then and then travel lanes, you know, the, there was a, a two lane road and there was a lot more yard there. So is it wise for us to let people build within 10 feet of a road when some at some point in the future, the road might get widened and we might have a big problem with them being so close to the road. Why would we have a problem? They might have a problem. I don't think there's any big problem that comes from there and maybe it'll stop the roads from being wide and that close to their house. We yeah, stopped them in the past. Regardless, this is, you know, That's if somebody wants, to take. this is a minimum. If somebody wants to set their house back farther, they have uh, an infinite ability to do that. Um, there's a lot of environmental reasons to encourage the smallest setbacks possible. Less driveway, no, I'm less just, impervious uh, surface. Um, letting them ramble the reason, on. How's the game? What's the score? Where about you? You're not <laughs> needed. There we go. She is, she is now. <laughs> um, you know, the reason that those, all the buildings that I showed were working buildings, the reason they were built where they were is because building them farther away costs money in maintaining an access that's longer than necessary. Um, that, that money is still an issue, but it's also an environmental issue of creating a bunch of excess impervious surface. Um, and that's really our trade-off between the feel that we want and the environmental um, uh, functionality and impacts of our development. Um, now in, in, the, in the early days, you know, before um, car travel became common, the, the farmhouses, along with the uh, houses in the, in the hamlets, were almost all located fairly close to the road and yep. the farm buildings as well. Uh, and that's when you were shoveling your driveway by hand, probably. And, <laughs> right. You know, you know, and now people would, you know, with their, their three quarter ton pickup trucks and their plows, you know, don't mind having a 900 foot driveway. Well, you know, it may, it may not always be thus. Um, and, um, you know, to mandate a, a larger setback is, uh, in my mind, unnecessary. People could still choose if they build back if they want to. And why mandate a yard, huge backyard, rear yard? 
Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm open to question about that. Yeah, well, so that sticking was- to, Sticking to the front yard for a moment. Um, these days, if you run a plow, I, I just, I, I, my original thought that was 10 and 20 was way too small. I think you're making some good arguments, but I think the 10 is pushing it real hard. All right. Um, just to be clear, we're talking about 10 from the outside of the ditch. So yeah, to, to be to play devil's advocate, way. suppose we didn't have any at all. OK. What would be so terrible about that? You think people would be so foolish as to build the house right on the, you know, on the edge of the, of a, a presumptive right of way? Um, well, I'm thinking about my section of Comfort Road, ditch on one side, non-existent. Ditch on the other side, not like it is on 96B. No, for sure. And it would be foolish to build that close. But that never stopped anybody from being foolish. Exactly. Further down, further further down the road, um, uh, the the first house on Southern Comfort Road was built a goodly distance back from the road. I know you poo pooed it earlier, but the road has migrated ten or twenty feet toward his house. It's eating up his front yard. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and I don't I don't see that as being at all desirable. But but it happens. Yeah, it does. Uh, and and if if he had been so foolish as to build ten or twenty feet from the house from the road, which at the time was practically a cow path, uh, he would be in big trouble now, or the town would be because you, you <laughs> they'd, they'd be uh, trying to do eminent domain on his on his front porch. And who's responsible if all of a sudden the plow comes by and the snow ends up in your living room? <laughs> Well, you better not be going that fast, but going through town. Right. So oh. there, are, there are various purposes for enacting a front yard setback. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that one of them is to protect someone from being foolish. Uh, zoning should really stick to protecting the impacts on neighbors, not protecting people from making bad choices for themselves. The, the purpose is to protect the community. Um, so good point. Good point. I like us, yeah. But these, um, but these days, the typical reaction to one's own foolishness is to sue the person who stands on yeah. their on the on the meaning of the law. Yeah, yeah. But so, I uh, guess I just when other... you're talking, David, about impacts on neighbors, then I'm saying, well, what if someone wanted to build ten feet back from the road? across the road from me. It's the impact on me that I'm worried about as the neighbor. It's gonna have a significantly different impact if their house was as set back as yours is, which is not a huge amount more than that. Across the street, it's not, it's not a big difference, a few feet one way or the other. But I'd like to come back to the it actual It isn't a few table. feet. I'd it like isn't to... a few feet. So I'd the like, difference between- Rhonda, I'd like to come back to the table um, so that we can accomplish something today. Uh, we have less than 15 minutes left. Um, I've proposed a set of numbers. We haven't heard anybody propose something that they think is better that we can run by the group. Um, I'd so like to suggest- just, win, you, you, uh, you, were going to, you were going to address why the rear yards were what they are, what suggested what they are. Sure, uh, I'd, like but, to do, but, I'd like to do that, but first I wanna make space to say that Lynn emailed me a suggestion, which was that we just do 50 feet all the way around, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think is a bad suggestion. I think the group should consider. Um, before we do that, I'll answer the question of the, the large rear setbacks are in response to these concerns about um, and it's not my concern, but I, it did seem like it was the group's concern about having things back to back and wanting to be sure that when you had a lot, um, there wasn't gonna be something right behind you. And I think it makes the most sense if that's a concern that a lot of people have, you should put the space behind them on their lot. And that means having a big rear yard. 
Um, and then you know you'll be far away from anything that comes uh, on yeah, the next block. Yeah. Well, that's a good, that's a, that's a reasonable argument. And I agree with that. Although I, I do know, I question, uh, David, why, why did the rear yard fall to 100 feet on high priority? Uh, it's a thousand. Oh, oh it, it says a like hundred. It says a hundred. This? No, no oh, not the cluster. Here. There, yes. Sorry. Oh, there, yes. There, there they're all a hundred. Um, because that's not that high priority preservation zone is things like the Bambi State Forest. It doesn't really have rear substantially. I was just saying, keep everything 100 feet away from the boundaries of it is more, it's not really protecting the parcels that are in that, it's protecting um, the parcels outside ostensibly. So I didn't think it mattered if it was front side or rear. So just to be clear, these setbacks don't apply to two acre lots. That one might carve out of a bigger site. But lots, lots in the cluster, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, how do they apply to existing lots? There are two acre lots in rural, uh, actually, there are four acre lots in rural too. Sure. A 100 foot setback means you can't build anything. So if it meant you can't build anything, you would be a prime candidate for a variance from that because it's a difficulty that you didn't create and right. every lot has the right to build a house on it. Right, right. And, and that goes back to what I was asking before. There aren't, we're saying, there aren't an awful lot of existing small lots in rural one and rural two, and that's by design, correct? Wait a minute, you, know, you said existing? Existing, in other words, people who would be in the situation where, that Lynn is describing. Well, I mean, most of the ones that are that, are that size are already, they already have a house on them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just say so, they're already developed and yeah, so there's no, what, what, they're, they're not something that anybody would want to subdivide. Right. Well, I'm just trying able to, say, to. I can Lynn's think of three. Was I can sort of, think of three lots within a quarter of a mile of my house that. Uh, I, I actually, I, I just, I think I can of. think of the same three lots. But Lynn's concern was sort of answered by David that variances. But well, yeah, like that there aren't all that many of them. This is not a frequent case. Yeah, the problem would be the rear yard requirement for the existing lots. Yeah, that are not yet developed. Yep. I go back to my proposal of fifty or seventy-five feet on all sides. It eliminates trying to figure out what front and back is. Uh, if you have a flag lot or a and a lot that's not rectilinear to the road. Um, front and back and side don't necessarily mean anything. Yeah, it does mean that you can have somebody behind you fairly close within 100 feet of your house. You in can a flag lot situation. Well, I, whether it's on the back or the side, it, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of difference to me. Um, but that's my opinion. Yeah. It would be a lot easier if it was consistent on all sides. It would be a lot simpler. The 50, 50, 50 sounds like a good, good alternative. The, it, the, the problem with that is that the meaning of the setbacks on each side is different. We've had, we've just had a very good argument for why a front yard might be smaller and a very good argument for why a rear yard might be bigger. So it, I, yeah, but we also had an argument that you can't tell what's a side yard and a backyard in many cases. Um, like no, not in many cases, but it's not it's not all that uncommon to have weird shaped lots. Um, I actually but, think that we ought to be encouraging people to to think about setting houses so that they aren't necessarily facing the road. I think you can do a lot, uh, a lot of creative design of a house when it's not facing the road. I think that's yeah. true too, Rhonda, but what does that have to do with these numbers that we're trying to get to? I'm just saying that the consistency on all sides, it makes it easy that way. Okay. Well, I confess I don't feel that strongly about it. Um, you know, the consistency on all sides has some appeal. 
it has the appeal of simplicity, it's, but it that's about the only I mean that's the main appeal I'd say is, is simplicity. Yeah, but it loses the functionality. I think we're really at this point, I mean, I feel I feel pretty strongly that the rear yards, as said, are okay. And we're I would be happy to talk about side yards. You want to make it simple, fr front and side, make them the same. Although there is a good argument to have small front yards. So maybe maybe we can um, take it take a quick poll of who would uh, support moving to fifty foot all around, and we can run down. I actually need to change my view so I can see all of you. Um, and if we if there's significant support for that, we should talk more about it. And if there is significant support for keeping a large rear yard and talking about the front and side yard, we'll go that way. So those are kind of the two choices that we'll talk about. 50 all around or keep the rear and talk more about front and sides. Um, so I'm gonna call on people and I will start with Catherine. Which, um, which uh, zone are we talking about right now? Um, I, I think this is well, really for both rural one and rural two. Rural two. And rural one. one and two, both. I, I'm going to abstain. I'm abstaining. I should be in the front. Um, Lynn, I, I think we can count on you. Yeah. Like 50, 50, 50. Um, Rhonda. 50, yeah. but yeah. front. Yep, I agree. Could be smaller. Yep. Oh, we're uh, not muted. We're not muted. I could not live with that because that would allow a person to, um, to make their rear yard 50 feet if they wanted, but they could also make it 300 if they wanted, right? Right, yeah. 50 feet's a minimum, not a maximum. Right, I, I, yeah, I could go with that. Okay, uh, Jonathan. Uh, like 20, 50, 50, 50, 20 in front, something like that, and then 50 all around. Well, not 50 all around, but 20 in front. Right, so I, then I don't agree with 50, 50, 50. Okay. Uh, Leslie? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the side and rear, I, I, I think it's a good idea, but I think I would like to keep the option of um, having it closer to the road than 50. Okay. Uh, um, but of course, if you have the house is facing sideways, that would, would that be the side yard? <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> The frontage defines it, the frontage. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah I don't know. Right. Anyway, so. I, I I like the idea of it being 50 around on the sides in the back, but I would like the option of having it closer to the road. Okay. Yep. Um, at... um, yeah, I like the option of consistent all the way around, especially if you have the house that's not facing front, then the front yard is somebody else's side yard. Okay. Ted? Um... I feel strongly that the neighbors are much better protected with a large rear yard. The others I'm not picky about, so I can't vote in favor of this. Okay, uh, Toby. And, oh, Toby, did they have to say? Toby's out. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have to Corbett leave, right? and then Kevin, is, is that all who's here? I think that's it, all who's here. Corbett, Kevin. Ended. Toby's there. Oh, Toby's there. Well, he had to leave. Hmm. Kevin? I think he left it on, but... Yeah, I, uh, I had a connectivity issue, so I missed the exact question, but I favor being able to vary the front yard to get closer to the road. Um, you know, moderately large rear and the sides, I don't think have to be quite out to 50, so um, I don't know how that fits with whatever the question was. Sure. <laughs> so just, just to clarify, Kevin, um, we're, I think, Actually, the big difference we're coming down to is between my proposed rear yards, which are 200 and 300, and doing 50. Um, All around. <laughs> yeah, but I think we've I think we've had some discussion about 50 seems okay for the back and side, which is similar to 50 all around, and very different from the back needs to be really large. So, do you feel like the back needs to be really large, or like 50 would be reasonable for a rear yard? 
I'd say three sides 50 and less on the frontage side. So I guess sort of what Leslie okay. was saying. Okay. And Corbett. Um, so this would be in clusters? One... No, this is for the non clustered lots. So this is you break off your, you've got uh, 20 acres and you break off. And you have a house on it, so you break off one more lot. Yep. And at this point, that lot doesn't even have to be an acre or, or two acres. Well, then it would be clustered. But if, if you were just breaking it off regular, it would be 10 acres. It has to be 10 acres. But you could put it right on the road. Yep. Um, and you can never add any other houses, but you have to have 50 feet front, back, and side, or, or at least back, back and side um, from another person's property. Right, or the larger numbers um, that I proposed, which was 200 or 300 for the rear, but less for the side and front. So really, I think we're deciding kind of on the rear here, if, if we want 50 being consistent with side, um, or if we want right. a larger rear. All right. Well, I'm going to lose the vote, but I, I would go for the bigger backyard. I would go for bigger everything's myself if you have to have, uh, you know, but that's my personal feeling. Okay. Thanks. Would you, um, would you mind re-asking the question, since you've now boiled it down to the rear yard question, re-asking and seeing if that changes anybody's mind? Sure. Why don't we just ask it that way? Um, does boiling it down to the rear yard question change anybody's mind? So the question is, do you want a, rear, a large rear yard or not? And the issue is the side yard isn't 50, it's 20. But it might not be a rear yard. It might be a side yard. That, that, that's a confusion. The is positioned. Yeah, yeah, so that's a confusion. The rear yard well, always refers to relative to the road, regardless of where the house is. That's right. Right. Yeah. right. right. You know, you have, you have frontage. That's the front yard. And then the rear yard is the other side, <laughs> opposite. And, it, and the point is to protect against back-to-back -back houses, which will become more prevalent as we get more dense. Yeah, and well, you, but, it, but density is being controlled. Right, but, but you know, we, but you could end up with a cluster behind you though. There's very few places where they're back-to-back -back lots. Right now there is. Unless somebody's putting in a new road. Yeah. Um, exactly, right. we're, we're planning 20 years ahead here. Which we haven't yet addressed, but we might want to we might want to make a new road be much easier to do. At which point I'd go for the 300 feet. Okay, so just to Me too. recap, it sounds like Ted, Corbett, and Kevin were in favor of a larger rear yard. I don't get a larger? vote. For it. I no. was in favor. No, I was in favor. Larger yeah. one. Sorry, Kevin, I, I misunderstood. Yep. So Ted and Corbett were in favor of the larger rear yard. As am I. Okay. And then um, Kevin, Catherine, Lynn, John, Pat, Rhonda, and <laughs> Leslie were all in favor of the smaller rear yard. Um, yeah, the smaller front. Well, Catherine was oh. saying that they Smaller recall. front. No, well, I nodded with them, but I, I think it's the smaller front, not the smaller rear that we're saying. Well, they all of those people were okay with a fifty-foot rear yard. Oh, 50, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, if we, well, we are at nine o'clock. I would really like to. Yeah, I think we should resolve. Them. So, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think it's a problem going over, but. Okay. Um, so the strong majority of the group likes a fifty-foot rear yard. Does anyone have a problem with a fifty-foot side yard? Could I just ask a question here? Let's, in my particular case. Let's not do that, Rhonda. We don't have time. No, Rhonda, we don't have time. So we're not talking about creeks or anything. No, we're, we're not. We're, no, doing, not. we're allowing people to be within 50 feet of a creek. Well, that's that's another layer. A separate consideration. Okay. All right, so now is the time if you don't like the idea of both of these having a 50 foot minimum side yard, say something now. <laughs> Not you. Okay. All right. 
So we um, went from 20 to 50 on the side yard. Yeah. Yes, we and, did. Okay. I okay. think that's good. Um, front yard. Um, first question, should the front yard be different in rural one and rural two? Um, the reason I made rural one smaller is that it's more environmentally constrained, likely to be steep slopes. You might want to be closer, um, but do we want to have the same front yard in rural one and rural two? Yes. Why? Well, well okay. I because I don't want people building on, you know, in front of steep slopes, I guess. Because that's you know, kind of across the road from me. If he had, if Rhonda, we can't, we don't have time to talk about across the street. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, I asked. Um, so, okay. So it sounds like no one has a problem with them being the same. Um, and several people have said they'd like it to be smaller than fifty. Um, maybe I'll look to John and Leslie. Do you want to propose a number? What if they were both twenty? Okay. Who doesn't like them both being 20? I'm okay Me. with that. Me. Corbett and Rhonda. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that people have to do it 20. No, of course not. They can be right. farther back yeah. if they want to. It's just that's a minimum. Yeah. Corbett, you want to be I more think the minimum or... on the side should be 50. Oh, the minimum no. for the side is 50, but this, we're yeah. talking about the front now. Oh, okay. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're good. I pretty much agree at 20 is okay, okay on the front on both mm -hmm. in both well, sides. We haven't heard from everybody. No. Uh, Gavin and uh, Lynn. Uh, Lynn wanted it. It was his. Yeah. Lynn, Lynn, 50. Okay, Lynn. Yeah. Lynn, if I we wanted 50. To, I wanted 50, but I, you know, whatever. Say 50. 20's better for development. I like that. We've we've come to a state of compromise. Yes. <laughs> what do you want? Um, might I point out that, uh, I mean, I know this may be silly, but it just occurred to me that we have just talked about a 50 foot rear yard in protected areas relative to the low density residential, which has 75. Which is yeah. a different context with much smaller lots. Yeah. And the likelihood of adjacent. Yep. That's exactly right. Hmm. Yep. Okay. 20 in front, both zones, 50 on the sides, both zones, and 50 in the back, both zones. Which is exactly what they are now. Well, no, that's less than we have now. Right. Yeah. But these lots are a whole lot bigger than what we have now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. We We're just protecting land. Contiguous or large blocks. Yep. Yep. Well, great, folks. I don't think we're going to get anything else decided tonight. Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good, <laughs> yeah, that's a good start, time. though. Does that mean I just want, I'm, I'm maybe uh, I'm just thinking about this now. Does that mean that if you had a 10-acre parcel and it was, let's say, two acres wide and five acres long, that somebody could put their house all the way in the back at the 50-foot mark from the back? Yep. yep. Yes. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> well, you voted for it. <laughs> but that's long driveways again. That cost them a fortune in a driveway because exactly. that's a twelve feet. Twelve feet wide would turn out every five hundred feet, and the turnaround at the end. Uh, just a wide spot every five hundred feet. Yeah. Right. The Why wide would spot. we allow that? That doesn't really conserve land. We we shouldn't be allowing that. But we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, I hope you have a good weekend. Um, some progress today. I appreciate everyone working together. And Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. We're compromising Thank you. together. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> what a trip.